this is the second of five masterclass events that are happening all week here, um, where we get to chat to a University of Melbourne scientist and hear about all their incredible work. Uh, today, it is volcanoes from distant ancestors to diamonds. Uh, before we do begin, though, I do want to acknowledge country. Um, I'm I'm at Parkville, so is my uh, so is um, our guest today, and also everyone that's helping out with that um, event. Um, and just want to acknowledge that that is the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Um, they've been carrying this land for over over sixty thousand years. And this week of all weeks, it's very important to remember that uh, the Indigenous people of these lands are our first scientists. So uh, thank you everyone uh, for joining us. It's great to see you all. Um, 57 people and counting looks like. Uh, so today, um, uh, before I do introduce our guest, um, just a little bit of Zoom housekeeping. Now, obviously this is on Zoom and so um, uh, we have a screen separating us, but we want to make this as interactive as possible. So we've got the chat open. Um, so please use that as much as possible. Please add any comments and particularly any questions that you have throughout the presentation and we'll be getting to them at the end. Um, you can add any emojis in there as well. And you can also actually add any reactions to some comments or questions as well. And that'll help um, us to um, decide which comments and questions um, to be responding to. Uh, Oh, also um, another thing as well. So you can also change uh, the event from uh, gallery view to speaker view as well. Now there's a lot of, this is a meeting and there's a lot of people in here. Um, so if you want to go to the top right-hand corner of your screen, you can change it to gallery, uh, sorry, to speaker view, to speaker view, um, and it'll help to just focus on uh, the people in the presentation. So a little bit of a tidbit there. Um, awesome. Okay. So um, on to our guest. Uh, so, volcanoes, diamonds, and investigating the timing of human evolution, all in a day's work uh, for Dr. Hayden Dalton, now on screen. Uh, currently researcher and associate lecturer in the School of Geography, Earth, and Atmospheric Sciences here at the Univers University of Melbourne. Uh, he has studied at the University of Otago in New Zealand and here at the University of Melbourne, where he completed his PhD focusing on kimberlites, which are volcanoes that carry diamonds, which obviously we'll be hearing a lot more about. More recently, he has been travelling to East Africa to investigate hundreds of past volcanic eruptions and, the, and what they can tell us about human evolution. Now, overall, he is arguably the biggest fan of rocks you will ever meet. And I'm told his friends constantly send him photos of rocks and ask, what's this? And I know people do this because I do this. And believe me, he knows his stuff. Uh, so there is a whole rocky world of geology out there just waiting for us to dig up. So please put down the pumice and grind at us some time in your afternoon and welcome the rock star himself, Ms. Uh, Dr. Hayden Dalton. Hello. Wow, yeah, yeah. Did you like my puns? Very good. Very good. Excellent, excellent. Um, all right. So um, to let everyone know, so Hayden will be talking for about 20, 25 minutes. Um, so sit back, relax, um, interact as much as possible, and then um, we'll be getting to some Q&A. So chuck in those uh, questions into the chat and we'll be getting to them at the end. Over to you, Hayden. All right. Thank you, Julia, especially for those puns. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's very nice to have 80 people joining us this afternoon and counting to talk about our volcanoes. But to get us a little warmed up, I'd like to start with a question for you all. And this is where you're going to use the chat box to tell me your answer. What do you think a geologist does? Anything that comes to your mind, chuck it in the chat and we'll see how we go. Don't be shy. This is a test to see if you can use the chat. Okay, time travel via rocks. That's excellent. Study the history of the formation of Earth. Study the Earth. Very good. My Quickly just message him, tell him. Somebody keeps muting me. I don't know who's doing that. Um, are we okay now? Can we carry on? Yeah, I can hear you, Hayden. All right, cool. All right, let's carry on. So a number of the responses there talk about Earth's processes, Earth record, Earth's record, and of course, rocks. 
Now, when I was at primary school or at high school, if you were going to tell me that in my future, my job would involve studying rocks, I would have thought well, that's quite boring. But what I, I, I guess what I've learned since then and through my um, studies and my career to date, I've worked out that we use rocks to tell the story. So today I'm going to take you on a journey with volcanoes and explain to you how we use rocks and volcanoes to tell stories about Earth's past, but also the past of humans as well. But first, a bit of Geology 101 to get everyone up to speed. And so I'm going to talk first about onions, okay? You might have seen Shrek, and he tells donkeys that ogres are like onions. And perhaps you know why that is. That's because ogres have layers, okay? And just like an ogre, the earth is like an onion, and the earth has layers. And these layers are very important because they dictate different processes. So we live on this outside part here, the crust. We also have the mantle, the outer core, and the inner core. And all of these different layers have different properties which control what we experience here at the surface. So for example, the inside of our onion, the earth, is mushy and it can move around. And so here we see the hot part of the inside of the earth rising up and pushing the skin of our planet apart. And in this example, we see different parts of the Earth coming together, different parts of the skin colliding, and one part going underneath one another. And Earth's skin, our onion, is made up of tectonic plates. And in this reconstruction, we have plates moving across millions and millions of years. So this time that is counting down, every one of those is one million years. And we can see just how much, how far, these tectonic plates have moved across Earth's history. So right now, here in Australia, we're in the South Pacific. But some time ago, we were at the equator, we've also been at the South Pole, and we have danced around the surface of the Earth just like this. So our plates, the fact they can move, that's super important. And I'm going to briefly go through some of the impacts of these plates moving around our surface. The first, uh, of course, is earthquakes. So here we've got a clip from the Christchurch earthquake in New Zealand um, over a decade ago, which caused some damage to a lot of buildings and also, unfortunately, loss of life. And here we've got another earthquake in New Zealand that impacted some livestock. This is a high quarter earthquake, and we see that those cows were having their lunch, and then suddenly the ground fell away beneath them. And this made the headline news in New Zealand, of course. They were saved by helicopter. They're fine. <laughs> another impact of mountains... A sort of plates moving is, of course, mountain building, such as the Himalayas, the Southern Alps in New Zealand, the Andes. These are the impacts of, of plates moving. But today we are talking about volcanoes, okay, which is another consequence of the plates moving uh, on Earth's surface. I like this picture because it shows the crater of a volcano almost ready to erupt. We can see some molten uh, magma down there, soon to erupt to become lava and reveal the secret. Um, of the Earth's interior. And today I'm going to use volcanoes to talk about two things, as we've already heard, our ancestors and diamonds. Okay. So we're going to start with the diamond aspect first. And you may have seen a diamond um, in, a, in a ring or in some jewelry at a jewelry store. Um, my question to you, though, and Amber's going to put up a poll for you to participate in this question. How old are most diamonds? So when you see the pole launch, you can click on one of those answers and we'll see how we go. So I've got hundreds of years, thousands of years, tens of thousands of years, millions, billions, trillions. How old do we think most diamonds are? And I'll give everyone a chance to respond to that and then we'll see how we go. Okay, we're getting there. We've had almost 70% of people respond. All righty, Amber, I think we could view the results now. Okay, so we had a very, a very mixed uh, bag in terms of the voting. Um, the most popular res response was one to three million years. But what I'm going to tell you is that, if you stop sharing now, Amber, is that most diamonds were formed one to three billion years ago. Okay, so I've put the zeros there to show you how old that is. So I've been hanging out um, on the planet for billions of years. 
waiting to make their way onto a piece of jewellery or maybe into a, a diamond encrusted saw blade. Um, so they're old. Okay, that's the moral of the story. But where do diamonds come from? So this is a diamond from uh, Botswana, uh, a nice large one, and this is a pencil. The two things that they have in common is that they're both made of carbon. Okay, so a beautiful, shiny, translucent diamond, um, a piece of coal, um, a piece of pencil lead, they're made of carbon. But obviously we have them in different forms to make these different physical substances. So let's, let's take the diamond and try and work out where inside the earth it comes from. What I will just start by saying is that we're not 100% sure of where all diamonds come from. What we do know is that they must come from deep inside the earth. So this blue line here um, that you can see, that's the depth where we have the pressure and the temperature for carbon to exist as diamond and not graphite. So it's about 150 kilometers directly beneath our feet. But some diamonds have evidence to suggest they come from even deeper inside the earth, maybe 400 kilometers, 500 kilometers, or even 700 kilometers straight down inside the earth. And so with this very, very deep origin, so hundreds of kilometers um, in depth inside the planet, my next question to you, and again, you can respond to this in the chat, as if these diamonds form so deep in the earth, how do we get our hands on them? Give me some answers in the chat. Where do you think we get these diamonds from? How do we get them to the surface? Any ideas? Michelle makes a good point. We can make them in the lab now. Very good. We mine them, the movement of the earth upwards, the mantle moves, mining. Okay, some good responses there. Someone said we can do it with machines. Timber light pipes, volcanic eruptions, very good. So we were right there. It takes a special type of volcanic eruption to bring diamonds to the surface. And those eruptions, they produce timberlites. And what I'm going to talk about now for the next sort of five, 10 minutes is, is what is a kimberlite? Where do they come from? And how is it involved with, with finding diamonds? So these rocks, these volcanic rocks, they are the primary host rock to diamonds. So most of the diamonds on the earth come from these rocks. An example I showed you before, that was worth almost $70 million and it weighs about as much as a chocolate block. Okay, so it's pretty crazy. But for me, what's more interesting about these volcanic eruptions these kimberlites, is that they have their plumbing system, their origins in the deepest parts of the Earth. Okay, so they start from 150 kilometers at least inside the planet. No other volcano on Earth, the ones in Hawaii, the ones in Italy, the ones that we see in the Andes, none of those volcanoes have their origins as deep in the Earth as these eruptions do. And because of that, they can transport pieces of the deep mantle to the surface where we can hold them in our hand. And in my hand now, we have a piece of the mantle from 200 kilometers straight beneath our feet in my hand. That's because the kimberlites have their origins so deep they can transport the stuff to the surface. And now someone said um, machines before, we can get them with machines. Now this movie, the core, unfortunately is not accurate. At the moment, humans do not have the technology to drill their way to the center of the earth. And this movie, unfortunately, is also not real, okay? In fact, the deepest hole that humans have ever drilled is 12 kilometers in depth. Now on the scale of the earth's skin, we don't even get over halfway, okay? So we've got a long, long way to go if we want to drill in the machine to get these things ourselves. And that's why the kimberlites, the eruptions, are so important. And you can think of them as like our conveyor belt. So we have pieces of the deep earth, diamonds, bits of the mantle like this, for example. The only way they can get to the surface for us to be able to mine them or to hold them in our hand is because of this kimberlite conveyor belt system. So my job as a geochemist is to get some more information out of these rocks. 
I can look at the rock and I can say it's pretty, etc. Look at what it's made of in terms of the minerals. But as a geochemist, I want to get some chemical information out of the sample. So what do we do? We take the rock and we crush it into essentially dust, okay? And then we weigh out a very small amount. In this case, you know, it's like some milligram of rock dust. And then we put on a funny suit and go into a clean lab. And that clean lab is important because we don't want anything from the external environment getting into our sample. Because the chemistry outside, the chemistry of my clothing, is different to the chemistry of my sample. Once we've done that, got our dust into the clean lab with the, with the safe suit on, and we dissolve it in very strong acid. That's strong enough to dissolve your bones, okay? So be careful with this stuff. And then we put it onto like a stove top, a hot plate, and then after that, we put it in these things which are called steel jackets. And that dissolves our sample in an oven under high pressure. And all of this, this high pressure, this high temperature, that's required to dissolve just one milligram of rock. Because rocks, as you might expect, are quite hard and therefore they're hard to turn into a liquid. Once we've got our, our solution, our dissolved rock, we then go to another lab where we put our sample over what's called columns. And you can think of these like a sieve. And so what that does is separates out different elements. The elements that we don't care about, they're gone. But the elements that can tell us the age, the elements that can tell us where this magma had its origin in the earth, we retain them in this kind of sieving system. And then from there, we take our solution, which has just got one element of interest, and we show it to this thing called a plasma torch. And that's 10,000 degrees, which is twice as hot as the sun. And then from there, our sample gets blown up into individual particles. And those individual charged particles can then whiz around the machine called a mass spectrometer, which is here. And that can tell us the chemical information that we're after. So it's a long process, a lot of steps involved. But that's what we have to do to dissolve a rock and then get the chemical information that we need to answer some questions. So what were those questions for me? I wanted to find out when these things erupted, when did diamond carrying volcanoes erupt in Earth's past? I wanted to know why do these eruptions only occur in certain parts of the world and why are they so rare? I haven't told you that they're rare until this point, but it's important to know that these eruptions, these Kimberlite eruptions haven't happened um, for over 12,000 years. So even though we have, we have volcanoes going off every day in other parts of the world, these eruptions in particular have not occurred for 12,000 years. And most of them occurred greater than 50 million years ago. So they're rare. So let's go to some, what are some of my results. So I focused in Finland for my um, research, and I found out that these diamond-carrying volcanoes have erupted twice um, in two major pulses, 750 million years ago and 600 million years ago. So it wasn't yesterday, a long time ago, but it's interesting to note that there were these two distinct pulses of activity uh, in Finland. And so the second two questions are kind of linked. So why do they occur in certain parts of the world and why are they so rare? Let's discuss that. Let's look at the recipe to get diamonds and kimberlites together. What do we need? Well, you need a thick and an old onion skin. And what I mean by that is you need a thick old continent. And so in this map, of the earth, we have some different colors, and there's purple, pinks, and blues indicate old, thick parts of the earth. Okay, we zoom in closer to home. We see that Australia over here has got some purples and pinks, and New Zealand not so much. So let's think about the continent Zealandia as being the baby. Okay, very young, very thin, no diamonds. Okay, most rocks are younger than 500 million years old, but the grandparents are Australia, okay? Very old and a very thick continent, which means there are diamonds here. And there are even rock fragments in Western Australia that are 4.4 billion years old, compared to New Zealand, which is less than 500 million. And because of that, we find some spectacular diamonds in Australia. And in fact, most of the pink diamonds that you see in the world have come from the Argyle mine in Northwestern Australia. Okay, so if you see a pink diamond, out there in the world, there's a good chance it's come from Australia. So that's a recipe for diamonds, old and thick continents. 
you can't have these young thin babies like we have in New Zealand, okay? But what's the next step? We've got our diamond, we have to get it to the surface. We need the conveyor belt, and that is the kimberlite eruption. So then, why is this conveyor belt, these eruptions, why are they so rare? We need to look at what actually causes the eruption in the first place. What's the, what's the driving force to make this thing burst all the way to the surface from the great depths inside our planet? So remember that plates moving are an important part of our story. And in my case, my eruptions occurred in Finland 750 and 600 million years ago. And if we look at the Earth at that time, there was these things called supercontinents. So here we have, at 750 million years ago, a supercontinent where lots of the continents, almost all of the continents on Earth, were joined together. But at that time, it started to break apart. So the supercontinent Virginia, between 750 and 600, started to, to be broken up. And it would have looked something like this animation, where we have hot Earth coming up from inside the mantle, and that drives the plates apart. So our theory that we published was that the supercontinent breakup was what drove the Kimberlite eruptions at this time. So at 750 million years ago, the supercontinent started to break up, and then at 600 million years ago, the supercontinent completely broke apart. So those two time periods, these time step stamps, indicate both the onset and the completion of that breakup. But I will just declare at this point that the jury is still out on this. There are a lot of theories about what drives Kimberlite eruptions for obvious reasons, because it can be a lucrative business. I guess if you can predict diamond forming, diamond carrying eruptions. Um, but this this study has been going on for 40 years. And, and again, the jury is still out. So don't hold me to that if you're going to go looking for diamonds. All right. So we have covered the diamond part of the talk. It's time now to go to our ancestors. I didn't have a nice segue, unfortunately, but we're just going to jump into it. I'm going to tell you a story about how volcanoes link to our ancestors. So you may know that humans, Homo sapiens, evolved from primates. Okay, and the group that defines um, us and our ancestors is called hominins. So I'm going to talk about hominins for a while now, and that's the group that consists of modern humans, so us the extinct human species, and then all of our ancestors. And you may know as well that humanity started in Africa. Well, if you didn't, now I've told you. So all of these, like these symbols here in Africa, they are hominin fossil sites dating back 4 million years. Okay? And so our, our project, our ongoing research, focused in the Turkana Basin, which is shown here in this red box, and that's in Kenya. And so we're interested in helping to unravel the mystery of human evolution in this part um, of the world where all of humanity began. And so these are our ancestors. These are some of the fossils that were found in Kenya. You can see we've got some pretty strange looking crests on the head there, some funny eyebrows. We looked much different uh, compared to how we look today. So these were some of the examples. These aren't the real fossils. These are the um, the casts, because the real fossils are far too precious for me to be that close to them. So we want to go to this part of Kenya called the Takana Basin. And to do that, we get into a tiny plane in Nairobi. And we fly out to the middle of nowhere. We stop halfway, as you can see here, to refuel. And then we carry on you know, on, our, on our journey to end up somewhere else in remote parts of Africa. But what are we doing here? What are we looking for? We are looking for layers of volcanic ash. And we're going through lots and lots of it. Here we are here. Here's Saleh, my PhD student, Ash and Sony, Supervisor Dave, and some goats. We are scouring um, remote parts of Africa for volcanic ash. Here we are again on a very, very hot day looking for ash. And what, what are we looking for? So we want the ash, but what's inside the ash? That's what's important. We are looking for pumice. And... Pumice you might know is the material you can use to exfoliate your heels, maybe, in the pharmacy. But the stuff that we get is straight out of the volcanoes, and it looks a bit more like this, okay? Unfortunately, the pumice comes in many different shapes and sizes, so we have to look very, very closely like we are there. 
I've got a piece here, okay? This one's almost as big as my face, this piece of pumice. This is from, from Kenya. But sometimes it can be very, very small, okay? So we've got some examples here where it's not even as big as the pocket knife. So we look very long time, very hot days to find these pieces of pumice. But why? Again, let's come back to our ancestors. The bones themselves, we can't directly date. There's no technique that exists at the moment to date these bones of this age. And so I'm going to explain what we're doing. This is a very, very hypothetical scenario, but it will help explain um, what we're up to. So I want you to imagine there's a hominin walking around in Kenya and they're having a great, good old time. Unfortunately, four million years ago, they passed away. Okay, They end up in the ground. And then a volcanic eruption occurs and it covers their remains, their bones and ash. And then let's say a million years later, a different hominin walking around the same place, unfortunately also passes away, ends up in the ground and gets covered by another eruption. And then a million years later, this dude with the crest on his head walking around, unfortunately passes away. Their remains get covered by a volcanic eruption. So now you can see each one of these volcanic ash layers can contain the remains of ancient people. And so when we get the pumice, what we're trying to do is date the eruption. So date that ash that contains those bones to give them an age. So we get the pumice like this, and then we have to smash it up. So we break it up like we see here, tiny pieces, and we're looking for treasure. Okay, this stuff, uh, this is a close-up shot. I've got a little bit of it in this jar here. We're looking for these tiny, tiny crystals of feldspar, and we can use those to get an age for the eruptions. There's a process called argon-argon dating. I'm not going to go into the details, but the key part about this technique is that our samples go to a nuclear reactor. We send them off to America and Oregon, and they get hammered with neutrons in a process that creates isotopes for us to measure. And then bring them back to our lab, and we basically blow them up. Okay, so in this gif here, that grain is being heated so much that it melts back into glass, and it gives off a gas that we can analyze. And that gives us the age. Okay, some results. So I do all this work, and what's the outcome? So in this plot here, we have age and millions of years on the x-axis. And in this little part, we have some previous results from other people. The three different ash layers called narrocotomy. And we can see that the uncertainty, these error bars, they all overlap. So we can't distinguish between individual eruptions. But on our new machines, our new results here in Melbourne, we can now distinguish between individual eruptions. So we can say that the blue one is different to the yellow one. Whereas before, both the blue, the yellow, the purple, they all overlapped. But now we can say definitively, these are the ages of those individual eruptions. And just one last example before I wrap up, is that this is a whole series of um, previous results in these gray bars and our new results in the colors over top. And we have severely, I guess, modified the ages, but also the uncertainty. And that's really important. If you're an anthropologist or an evolutionary biologist, what you want to know is when is this evolution occurring? When do we go from spe species A to species B to species C to humans? And so anything we can do to change that uncertainty is um, super useful. Right, just to wrap up, um, I'm just going to touch on some thank yous. Okay, science is a team effort, and the theme for this week is collaboration, innovation, and impact. And so on the theme of collaboration, I have to thank my students, my supervisors, every single person that's helped with my analyses, and of course my thanks to the Takana Basement Institute and the traditional owners of the Takana and Masabit regions who led us onto their beautiful uh, country in, in Kenya to do this work. And with that, I'll take any questions. Amazing. Thank you so much, Hayden. That was such a great presentation. So many amazing animations and videos and photos. And um, I was uh, very close to the screen many, many times just to try to get a get a glimpse of all those um, diagrams. So thank you so much. Um, so we will be taking um, some questions now from everyone. Although before we do that, I forgot to do one thing in the introduction, and I think it's sort of key. 
because we want to know everyone that's out there watching. It's up to over 100 people now. So I'll give you a chance uh, to catch your breath, Hayden, um, and just get everyone to tell us where you're from. Where what, where are you Zooming in from? What suburb, what country, what um, state, what school, all that sort of stuff. Let us know. Um, give Hayden a chance to catch his breath and then we'll jump into some questions. Melbourne, Central Queensland, Indonesia. Oh, 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 oh. China, Melbourne, Melbourne Uni, lots of Melbourne, Perth, lovely. Castlemaine, love it. A couple of people from China, homeschooling, love it. Shanghai as well. A couple of people from Shanghai yesterday as well. Awesome. Lots of people from Melbourne as well. Okay, well, that gives you a bit of a sense about who we're talking to, Hayden. Just um, to have to tell you questions. Um, amazing. Thank you, everyone. All right, so uh, let's um, jump into some questions then. All right, so first question, Hayden. Um, so it's from Yugita. Once tectonic plates are burst apart, um, like with the volcanic eruptions that you showed, um, can they ever reconnect or do they continually break apart and get smaller over time? Good question. That's a great question. Um, and I guess what evidence suggests today is that we we have been continually um, breaking apart and rejoining. So imagine that a billion years ago, the jigsaw pieces were together and then a bit later on, they were taken apart and then put together a different arrangement. So essentially, the continent itself, so let's say Australia, for example, we won't ever probably split into more pieces, but we might attach to Indonesia, or we might attach to America. Um, not on our lifetime, because they move as fast as your fingernails grow, but eventually um, there is certainly a, a high chance that we'll be bumping into someone else in, in the future. So continents will come together again. Um, as for when, uh, there are plenty of people that try and model that kind of thing now and are ongoing. Um, but unfortunately, we won't be next to Bali in our lifetime. <laughs> um, yeah, that's um, it's amazing. I guess things are ever changing. I guess just like um, with everything else. Um, awesome. Okay, so uh, one from Karen. Um, uh, I think you mentioned four layers of the Earth. What do you think about the possibility of a fifth layer being the innermost inner core comprised of iron and nickel, as similar to the fourth layer? It's a very specific question, and <laughs> I might have oversimplified it. There are many people argue for how many layers there are in our onion. I guess the broad definition is the, the crust and the mantle and the core. The core has two components that we think of, the inner and outer core. Potentially, Karen is suggesting another layer inside that core. Um, and then the mantle is broken up into the, the uppermost and lower mantle as well, and that has different properties between the upper and lower parts. Um, People are, are basically taking images of the inside of the Earth whenever there's an earthquake. So when an earthquake occurs, that signal goes through the center of the Earth to the other side. And based on the transmission of that earthquake signal through the center of the Earth to the other side of the planet, we make a guess about what that stuff must be made of. Mm -hmm. So earthquake waves can't travel through um, certain parts of the Earth's interior if it's too hot or, or too liquid, for example. Um, so that's how we know what it's made up of, but people are still trying to nail down just how many layers are actually inside it. So I don't know the answer. It's essentially, there's more than four. Could be many layers. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like you were describing like an X-ray, like, like an Earth X-ray sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, exactly what it is, an Earth X-ray. Yeah. Lovely. Um, all right, Kiara. Is it possible to estimate how many diamonds are still to be found? And actually, well, I guess this is Kiara and Beck, because are we going to run out of diamonds soon? And or is it possible to estimate how many diamonds are still um, to be found? So what's okay. what's the what's the diamond status? I think is the question. Um, my my thinking is that there are a lot of diamonds down there because they were formed so long ago. There was a, a diamond forming um, window in Earth's history where the conditions were just right to make these diamonds. Mm. And so, as I said before, we're waiting for the conveyor belt. They're just hanging out. <laughs> and so we can't really predict if we're going to run out anytime soon. The only reason we would is because commercial companies um, who might have a, a stockpile will control the market by how much they release. So this rarity about diamonds could be controlled by commercial factors as well. Mm. But from a scientific point of view, I can say that these volcanic eruptions, the conveyor belt is actually rare. But for how much people have gotten their 
giant warehouses? I, I don't know. And so yeah. for Beck's question, are we going to run out? Um, I don't think so, but also we need more eruptions to convey about to bring them up. Yeah. So they could be down there. I think they are down there. I've, I've put my put my hat on there. Got it. Um, all right. Now, Vanessa, is pumice the only way to date human fossils? Um, not necessarily, no. So they can be found, um, the remains can be found in lots of different layers of rock. It just so happens that in Kenya, the remains are found in between volcanic rocks. And so the pumice is from the volcano and we date that. Um, but if, if it was, say, a more modern um, person that may have passed away um, in an ancient forest and there was um, some wood above and below them, you could use radiocarbon dating, but that only works for, for tens of thousands of years. So there are many techniques to date things. It just depends on what the bones are actually in. Yeah. And so in my case, it was the volcanic ash. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Um, thank you. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for your questions. Um, they, they're just, they're, they're continuing to come. Very popular presentation, Hayden. Um, so, uh, uh, Eamon, um, does the amount of time underground affect the colour of the diamond? I'll, I'll answer this question and also the one about the diamonds being pink as well, because they're kind mm. of related. Mm. So... Some of you might have heard about diamond clarity and the cut and the color, the four C's. Um, and so the color of diamonds comes from imperfections. So if it was just carbon and carbon only, the diamond would be completely um, translucent and transparent and worth lots of money. But these imperfections, they come from other elements that have gotten into the diamond. So you can have pink, yellow, blue, brown diamonds. And that's because of elements like boron and nitrogen that enter the structure when it formed. Mm. And so just a tiny amount of boron or nitrogen or even other elements can change the color drastically. Mm. Um, and so that's why we have different colors. Mm. Um, and that can happen when it, when it formed essentially. And yeah. that can be that color the whole time. So it isn't, isn't the length of time in the ground. It's because of um, those impurities, the stuff that isn't carbon. Yeah, 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 yeah right. Um. Yeah. Okay. So it's not necessarily the diamond, but it's what's in in the carbon. Mm -hmm. Um. What connected with the carbon. Um. Uh, okay. So from Richard. Um. Where Where is the youngest known kimberlite, and have diamonds been found associated with this occurrence? So that's in um Tanzania, um mm -hmm. around twelve thousand years ago that occurred. Uh, and there's no published occurrences of um there being a massive diamond load associated with that. And that's another good point, actually, to Richard's uh, question, is that some kimberlites come to the surface and they miss the diamonds, right? Mm. So these these conveyor belts don't always have to convey the same amount of material. Mm. So that's why there aren't diamond mines with every kimberlite. So there are thousands and thousands of kimberlite eruptions, but only, you know, tens to hundreds of diamond mines around the world. Mm. But it's not, it's, it's random, the sampling. Yeah, okay. So, and, you know, for my, for my PhD, I looked at 12 different kimberlites, but only three or four of them had, had diamonds. Yeah, right. Um, are the majority of these kimberlites with diamonds, like, in Africa? I mean, it just seems to be um, you've done a lot of other work in Africa. I guess it's slightly separate, but... Well, it's, it's where the earth is the oldest and the coldest and the thickest. So mm -hmm. that's in South Africa, Russia, Canada, um, parts of South America. Yeah, mm -hmm. near the old... The old thick stuff. Mm -mm. Um, where humanity began. I did write that down. That was a very important part of your presentation. Um, okay, love this question. Cassandra, as a geologist, what does your day-to-day -day look like? This is great. Um, and how would you suggest someone gets into the field of geology? Love this question. Love, fantastic question. Um, oh, I, I would try and give a brief version of a week. Every day is different. So some days I'm, I'm teaching, I'm giving lectures to our third year um, geochemistry class. Um, some days I spend in the lab, so I'm I'm taking those um, crystals that we that I showed you before, putting them into our machine and blowing them up to get the gas out to get the age of those eruptions. Um, part of my job is to also publish my results. So I have to write publications to share with the community, the, the geoscience community, but also I like to share my results with with you, with the the broader public. So um, that's a, a brief snapshot but of course there's fieldwork involved and many of my colleagues go to all parts of the world 
to get their samples. I would say on average, they might spend a couple of weeks to a month overseas or around Australia um, sampling for, for their research. Um, and to get into geology, well, that's a that's a good question as well, because it's not often taught in, in high school. In fact, it really is, apart from maybe year, year eight and nine science. So my high school, I had chemistry um, and geography and, and all the sciences, actually. And I got to university and discovered geology. So I kind of stumbled upon it by doing uh, geography and geology as a double major. And then from there, I stuck with geology because I loved working outside, learning outside and I guess unraveling the secrets around around me. So why is there volcanoes happening in my home country? Why is there mountains? That was kind of the stimulus for me um, getting involved. Mm. Amazing. Um, I hope that answered uh, your question, Cassandra. Oh, sorry. sorry? I, I hope so too. Good question. Oh, yeah, I hope so. Um, all right. So I think we've only got a couple of minutes left, um, and I think this is a nice way to end. Um, have you ever been up close to a volcanic eruption? Um, and if not, is it a life goal, or would you avoid it? So there are there are a lot of um, volcanoes around South America and Italy that you can go and view safely and they erupt almost daily and the same in, in Hawaii so there is a life goal I haven't seen one yet mm. um, and as I said before these kimberlite eruptions they haven't been observed for 12,000 years so I'd love to be around for one of those but that would be explosive yeah. I would I would say it's safe it's safer to avoid them and make and make sure um, that you don't get too close because they can have bad consequences um, but oh yeah, always view from a distance, I suppose, is the takeaway here for OHS purposes. Sure, it's a life goal though. You gotta you gotta see the volcano. Okay, yeah, I, I, yeah, I will. From okay. afar, from a safe distance. From a safe distance. Um but I'll take the life goal part. What is there anything else that you'd love to be studying or or a particular volcano that you want to be studying? Like what's the what's the ultimate? Um I mean, apart from what I'm doing now and in East Africa, I'm really interested in about the young volcanic eruptions around Melbourne and the east of Australia. So you might not know, but around Melbourne, there are the hundreds of lava flows that are very young, only in the last sort of million, even less than that, <clears throat> years. So to try and understand more about that volcanism and why it's happened in Australia, we have quite a stable continent. It's quite interesting. One day. Amazing. And I love how a million years is young. It's just the world, the world of a geologist. It's a little right. bit different time scales. Very good. Um, awesome. Um, well, thank you so much. That was an amazing presentation. Um, and thank you everyone out there for all the amazing questions. Um, uh, we're gonna. Um, I did. I, I really wanted to ask about what the segue was between diamonds and ancestors, but we'll just have to leave that um, for next time. Next time we have Hayden on the mid afternoon masterclass. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, so thank you again. Um, there'll be uh, a few extra resources, I think, put in the chat for anyone that wants to know uh, a little bit more. Um, and, of course, uh, the mid-afternoon masterclasses are happening all week. So we have got um, another event happening tomorrow, um, and it's with Matthew Mack from the School of Mathematics and Statistics, and his talk will be Hot Dogs, Triangles and AI pattern finding in machine learning. So that's going to be super interesting. Um, Thursday with Mia, we will take, uh, uh, she'll take us through a day in the life of your dog. Amazing. Um, who doesn't love the pet story? And wrapping up the week on Friday is Sonia, who will be telling us why different foods taste wonderful together. What a week. So exciting. Um, so that's it. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, thank you again, Hayden. Amazing presentation. Um, and have an amazing uh, later afternoon, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.